Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. We're here for oral argument in case number CV19-0268. It's in re the matter of Carolyn E. O'Brien v. Brendan T. O'Brien. Counsel, a couple of housekeeping matters real quick. We'll just remind you that these oral arguments are being audio and video recorded. It'll be available on YouTube in a few days. And we ask you to please identify yourselves and your clients at the beginning of your arguments. Also, each side will have 20 minutes. Counsel, for appellant, if you want to reserve some time for rebuttal, please watch the clock and save as much time as you deem appropriate. Also, please keep in mind we've read the briefs. We're familiar with the record and have discussed the case this morning in conference. With that, counsel for appellant, you may proceed. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Mary Kay Grenier, and I am the attorney for Brendan O'Brien, who is the appellant in this matter. I asked for this oral argument today because I felt that upon receipt of the response brief, it only served to muddy the waters that I felt were crystal clear in our opening brief. And in addition, I felt that when wife's counsel on appeal did not know how to properly address an issue that we raised in our opening brief, she raised issues that were entirely irrelevant to the points that we were trying to make in our brief. As a result of that, I'm here today to explain once again in our opening brief that what the court relied on to make its findings for the Drejos calculations on the North Beach and the Tahoe properties, and when it made its determination of father's HELOC or home equity line of credit that was secured by his separate properties, the court relied on information and evidence entirely insufficient, entirely erroneous, and not supported by the trial record. I'll start with the Drejos calculations and the community lien determination made by the trial court. Let's start with the Tahoe property. Drejos or Valento are the calculations that are made when a separate property, a community lien has been asserted against a party's separate property. In this case, husband had separate property apartments in California. During the marriage, it was alleged and proven that community monies were used to pay down the principal mortgage on those properties. If there is no principal pay down during the marriage, there is no Drejos calculation and there's no community lien. So at the core of every Drejos calculation is how much principal was paid down during marriage. When the court determined the community lien, it literally opened up wife's pretrial statement, picked that number, and put it in its minute entry in decree. And in doing that and just outright adopting mother's numbers, it disregarded the clear evidence at trial that mother's numbers were wrong. For instance, on the Tahoe property, there was a principal pay down that was offered by husband through direct testimony. In Exhibit 152 was the date of marriage mortgage statement showing $350,000 was due. And on the date of... What was the original? Is there evidence in the record that shows the original mortgage balance? 100%. It is in Exhibit Number 2 to Trial Exhibit 52. And what's the amount? I'm sorry, 152. What's the amount of that? $350,000. Was the original balance? 
was the original mortgage balance. Okay, but what was the balance on the date of marriage? On the date of, on the date of marriage, correct. Well, are they the same? I mean, was this loan taken out on the date of marriage? I'm saying, I'm saying what was the original balance of the loan, original balance? The, well, the original, from the day it was taken out, when, original, when was it taken out? Do we it know? was taken out well before marriage. Okay. So what is the relevant question is, what was the, date, what was the mortgage balance on the date of marriage? Okay. The mortgage balance on the date of marriage was $350,000. So how did wife expert come to the conclusion that it was $374,305? I have no idea. And at trial, during cross-examination, he was presented with trial exhibit 152, and he was presented with the date of service statement showing $273,000 on the date of service, or September 2016, which is trial exhibit number 114, and he agreed. And he said, I have no reason not to agree with your numbers. Doesn't exhibit 152 that you're referring to, doesn't it say the original loan amount was $350,000, not necessarily the loan amount on January 1st of 2005? If you look at trial exhibit 152 and exhibit 2 to that trial exhibit, there is a line, and it's a Washington Mutual statement, and it says 1-1-2005, and it gives the number $350,000. Doesn't it say original amount above that? I don't believe so. The date of marriage, and it would be nonsensical to think that the mortgage would have gone up during marriage and not on the date of marriage. Unless there was a reverse mortgage or something like that. Yeah, no, there was no evidence to that. Nothing in the record. Nothing in the record on that issue, no. So the point being, I'm sorry. The January 1st, 2005 number clearly is very helpful in this situation. Date of marriage, right? Correct. And to the date that your assertion is that the bank effectively certified through its own documents, its own information, and its computer base or whatever, that the sum was $350,000 on that day. Correct. That would seem like everyone's dream starting point, right? The first day of the marriage, number certified by the bank is $350,000. Is that right? That's correct. Then what was the amount at the date of dissolution? Date of service. Date of service, sorry. $273,227. So there was the principal pay down during the marriage, the delta between $350,000 and $273,000. Did Mother's expert concede that the exhibit you're referring to demonstrated that the balance was $350,000? So during the trial, the exchange was, and all of this valuation information wasn't presented through my client. It was presented through the cross-examination of David Cantor. And he was handed the Washington Mutual Statement. He was handed the Chase Statement from the date of service. And he did what every opposing expert does. And he said, I have no reason to disagree with you. So that got as close as you're going to get from an opposing expert in agreeing with you. And he agreed that the documents demonstrate that the principal pay down was, as we proposed it in our pretrial statement and with our evidence. And he did not disagree. The reason why that becomes so critical is because that principal pay down figure is what drives the rest of the Drejos calculation. And if that figure's wrong, then the rest of the Drejos calculation is wrong. And nothing else really matters, although I'll go take it another step further and tell you that the valuations on the Tahoe property were also entirely in error. And even through Mr. Cantor's testimony, the valuations were called into question. The husband presented evidence as close to the date of marriage as possible and as close to the date of service as possible that the valuations were $627,000 and $540,000 respectively. In other words, the 
property depreciated during marriage wife's first set of appraisals she hired somebody in san francisco to do a desktop appraisal he didn't ever go to the property he just sat on his computer and filled in information no site visit no anything that's what you mean by desktop is they didn't they didn't they didn't do a site visit to appraise the property he sat at his desk but what information was in front of him whatever he could find on the computer in fact if you look through the transcript um and you look at the actual appraisals all of the boxes on the bottom of the page where it says site visit uh interior visit exterior visit property visit none of those were uh checked and at the very end it says was there any sort of eyeball look at the property at all and the box was no but counsel wouldn't that go to just the weight of the evidence i mean the court's saying okay i got this bucket of evidence this bucket of evidence i'm gonna weigh those and why is that clearly erroneous because in this situation wife presented two sets of appraisals the first set of appraisals that she presented agreed with us that the property depreciated during marriage when that was presented to her she went out and got another set of appraisals and this time the appraiser sitting at his desktop went and found a property a comp a comparable over nine miles away in squaw valley which is a vacation area on a mountain brand new property and used that particular property to increase the value in its appraisal is the first set of numbers in the record yes and how are we located so the appraisals that were provided to the court and it's in the opening brief just to be clear these are the numbers that you say that wife originally agreed with so wife's numbers originally were the first appraisal gave it a six hundred thousand dollar date of service value and the second appraisal gave it a seven hundred and fifteen thousand dollar date of service appraisal and both of those appraisals are in the court's record they were both admitted to trial and there was testimony discussed about the fact that the second appraisal they went out and bought another one we called these the bought and paid for appraisals they bought another one and this time it increased the value based upon this one property in squaw valley and we brought that testimony out at trial and so once again when the court i'm sorry do you recall what exhibit that is that first set of appraisals no but by the time i'm back up here on my on my reply time i will give that to you let me move on so that is just the tahoe property by itself the north beach property presents its own set of problems for the court when it adopted the valuation in mother's pre-trial statement by rubber stamping that number it ignored two things mr canter improperly included a heloc that did not exist on the date of marriage in the principal pay down but he added it in to the date of marriage mortgage balance which necessarily inflated the principal pay down because the bigger the number is on the date of marriage and the smaller the number is on the date of service the bigger delta you get and you raise the principal pay down and again the principal pay down is at the heart of these calculations and so by him erroneously putting a heloc on the date of marriage mortgage value when it didn't exist on the date of marriage was an error then he turned around and included it on the date of service or it excluded it on the date of service when it really did exist and it just the divide the delta between those two numbers were a hundred thousand dollars in error so it effectively showed an errant community investment correct and did the court specifically address this issue well by adopting mother's numbers it addressed the it adopted 
Mr. Cantor's findings that we talked about during the trial on his cross-examination that it was not incurred on the date of marriage, so he could not have properly put it in the date of marriage mortgage balance, which he did. Did Mr. Cantor agree that it was not in existence on the date of marriage? No, he didn't. He went off on a tangent about how it's appropriate to use HELOCs in certain situations and started talking about a bunch of different hypothetical situations when HELOCs would be included and when they wouldn't be included, and it really had nothing to do with the case at hand. And the other problem with the... He tried to show that it was in place on the date of marriage and in place on the date of service, and that just isn't true. And our testimony and the documents that we presented at trial for the North Beach property show that it wasn't in existence on the date of marriage, and so it could not have properly been used. And the information on our opening brief and the information discussed at trial, Mr. Cantor did agree that if the HELOC wasn't included, our numbers would be exactly the same. So, again, I suppose you could look at that as the closest we could get for an opposing expert as to his agreement with our numbers. And so if you agree with the fact that there was a tremendous amount of error in the court's understanding of what it meant to have a principal pay down be the cornerstone of the Drejos calculation, you have to find that the court's calculations and determination of the community lien was an error. I'll move on. I just want to save a few minutes at the end. I'll move on to the HELOC issue. At trial, there was a presentation of testimony as to Mother's home equity line of credit against her separate property residence, $100,000 and some change, give or take. And there was no question that, according to her testimony, it was used for community purposes. Fine. Father's testimony at trial, he also had a HELOC on his separate property in about the same amount of money, about $100,000. Two differences. Number one, Father, well, strike that. Not two differences. They were used for the exact same purpose. They were both used for community purposes. The problem that we have and how we know the court got it wrong is that in the court's footnote in its decree on page 20, the court said, unlike the HELOC Father incurred, which had no direct benefit to the community, but instead were used for the purpose of expanding, improving, and or maintaining a sole and separate property, Mother's HELOC was used for the benefit of the community. Totally false. That was a totally false statement that the court made. So the record would indicate that the court got that wrong? 100%. At what point in the court's transcript did the court get that wrong? So the point of time during Father's direct testimony when he presented evidence, check registers and checks written to wife in the amount of $69,000 for a country club membership that ultimately we learned that she didn't use to purchase the country club membership, but the check was written to Mother for $69,000. There was another payment of $30,000 that Mother used to purchase a Lexus, uncontroverted, and another payment of $92,000 that Mother used to pay taxes during the marriage, uncontroverted. So the more important thing is that there was no testimony at all during the trial that Father used that HELOC to improve his separate properties. So where the court came up with that finding, it doesn't exist in the pretrial statements, it doesn't exist in the trial transcript. And so for the court to treat those HELOCs differently, order Father to pay his for the reason he stated in the footnote, and order Mother's to be split 50-50, 
was a disproportionate allocation of community debt and i'll save my last minute and thirty seconds to come back thank you May it please the court, my name is Yvette Ansel and I represent the appellee, Carolyn O'Brien, who's actually seated here in the courtroom. Um, so everything, everything that was just discussed before you was, prevent, was presented the, to the trial court during the trial. It was not only presented to the trial court during the trial, but the specific <clears throat> arguments made in um, the opening brief and the reply brief were again presented to the trial court in a post-decree Rule 83 motion. So not only did the trial court make its first decision after listening to all of this, but then it affirmed its decision after all of the issues were brought up again by the appellant. Um, husband's position is uh, that the trial court's determination of the community liens in two properties is unsupported by any sort of substantial or reasonable evidence. That's without merit. Um, where there's evidence to support a judgment, it must be affirmed. And that's under the Court of Appeals case of DeForest. So at the heart of this appeal is that Mr. O'Brien is improperly urging the court to reweigh the evidence and to conduct another trial. Counsel, don't we have to look closely at alleged specific errors? And so in sure. that regard, let's, let's start with, let's go with the North Beach property. Correct. What, what evidence was there that there was a line of credit, a HELOC in place on the North Beach property on the date of marriage? Your Honor, there was a, there was a, a HELOC of that amount during the marriage that was taken not out. During, on, did, no, 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 I'm on, sorry. On the date of marriage. Correct. There was a HELOC taken out for that amount on January 1st, 2005. It's in uh, Mr. O'Brien's pretrial, um, and I'll tell you exactly where, and it was then transferred to the North Beach property. So it was on the Tahoe property. It always existed, and it existed on the date of marriage, which is January 1st, 2005. And is it so, credited by the court to the North Beach property? It, yes, it's, it's, it's on the North Beach property because it, it always existed on the date of marriage. So this case is a little bit more complicated than what appellant is making it out to be. This was a HELOC that always existed on the date of marriage. It had to be taken into account, and that's what Mr. Cantor, who was wife's expert, did. Um, so the calculation was absolutely correct. It's not a simple matter of um, there was no HELOC, because there was a HELOC, and it was taken out on the beginning of the marriage, and it was acknowledged by husband in his pretrial. Um, I think it's Exhibit 104 that uh, husband's counsel referred to. There's a, let a Schwab letter dated February 24th, I think, of 2005, congratulating the husband on a new homeowner line of credit on the North Beach property. Are it, you, is, it, it, the, the HELOC I'm talking about is a transfer from the Tahoe property that was taken out on the date of marriage, and then it was just transferred to North Beach, I believe in March of 2005, what, two what, months later. What exhibit or what testimony sure, I will, could, supports that assertion, counsel? It was in wife's pre-trial specifically. Is that evidence? Um, is that no, it, it was, it, there were documents presented, Your Honor, okay. in an exhibit that show that that um, particular uh, HELOC was taken out on January 1st, 2005. It was not paid off. It was simply transferred to be secured by the North Beach property. And it, I, but it was transferred later? It was transferred on March, in March, but it was never paid off. It was an, it was an obligation that was taken out on the date of the marriage and something that had to be taken in, into account 
in in the north beach calculations because it existed on the date of the marriage it just shifted from the tahoe property which was a property which was that second property that had the community lien in it and it shifted to the north beach property so was it on january 1st was it on the tahoe property or was on the north beach property it was on the tahoe property on january 1st it was not have been credited to the north beach property no but your honor it wasn't paid off it was simply transferred to the north beach property it sounds to me like we're bouncing one heloc between two properties and credit both properties with having them well no it didn't credit it to both properties we're just talking about crediting it to the north beach property we're not talking about crediting it so you're saying that sometime prior to the marriage that it was transferred to the north beach property no i'm saying it was taken out on that's why this is so confusing your honor unfortunately it was taken out on on the date of marriage january 1st 2005 on the tahoe property it had already been taken out on the day of their marriage on the date of their marriage they had time to go get a home equity loan on the day on january 1st that that was the that was what was in the documents and that was before the court i mean um it was literally that was the date january 1st 2005 but what document shows that there there's evidence in the record your honor um okay okay let's let's go there was let's go back to judge williams question let's follow up on that he how do you refute are you saying there's two home equity loans no of 100 000 because how do you what's your explanation as to the schwab letter dated february 24th 2005 right that congratulates them for congratulates mr o'brien for opening a home equity loan of 100 000 your honor that he was opening home equity lines all over the place on all of his properties on a consistent basis this was literally not an opening of a new home equity line this was simply a transfer from his tahoe property to his north beach property the bank got it wrong yes your honor i or it referred to another home equity line of credit because they were all over the place this man was taking out home equity lines on a consistent basis because he he also wanted wife to take out a home equity line because he had a relationship with a particular bank so this wasn't an unusual occurrence for this man he was doing home equity lines on a consistent basis but the home equity line has to be taken into account because it existed on the date of marriage it it was never paid down it was just transferred and how do we isolate it to one property or the other if we're just moving it around well um that would be the purview of the trial court who heard all of the evidence and heard mr canter's testimony and his evaluation of all of the properties and he determined that it should be counted toward the north beach property because it wasn't paid down and in essence the whole amount that existed during the marriage was should be taken into account on the north beach property because it did exist on the date of marriage and it wasn't paid down and and that's just the bottom line um you're not talking about you had one home equity on the tahoe property on the date of marriage he paid it down and then he just took out another home equity line a few months after the date of marriage on another property that would be a different situation but that's not the situation that existed in this case council i think you already answered this but i missed it sure what exhibit or where in the record supports that and your honor i'm trying to find that um there was a particular exhibit and it was acknowledged by husband as well in the pre-trial and i will find that hopefully before i finish my argument today um hold on one second it it is actually found um in mr o'brien's pre-trial of january 15th 2019 um and he he specifically listed the heloc as existing as of january 1st 2005 and on march 25th 2005 it was transferred from the tahoe property to be secured by the north beach property and there was documentation to support that as well but that's not something that was disputed that was something that that mr o'brien acknowledged and specifically put into his pre-trial um and you're 
Mr. O'Brien is trying to tell this court that it simply took numbers from Mr. Kant, from wife's pretrial and just put them in his ruling. That's not true. The bottom line was he heard testimony from wife. He heard testimony from Mr. Cantor. He heard testimony from Mr. O'Brien and he reviewed all the exhibits. And after all of that, the trial court determined that wife was entitled to just over 71,000 from her community lien in the Tahoe property and just over 197,000 from her community lien in the North Beach property. Mr. O'Brien's argument that there existed no evidence for the trial court to make its calculations as wishful thinking on his part because the situation is just a little bit more complicated than what Mr. O'Brien is presenting to this court. And while husband might not like the determinations of the trial court and would have preferred that the trial court used his calculations, that does not equate to error in this instance. Again, there's evidence to support the trial court's judgment and must be affirmed. This court works on the assumption that the trial court resolved every issue of fact in a way that supports the trial court's judgment. It did. At the trial level, husband testified about valuations and why he believed they were more credible than those of wife's appraiser, Mr. Mazzamuto. And Mr. Mazzamuto did the appraisals and then they were used by Mr. Cantor. Husband testified that Mr. Mazzamuto's appraisals were bogus and bought and paid for by wife, which is always the argument in these kinds of cases when you have an opposing viewpoint. The trial court heard accusations that Mr. Cantor was guessing with regard to valuing one of the properties and the trial court heard Mr. Cantor's response that he was not guessing. He used an amortization schedule, which is a reasonable way to calculate a property. And again, it's up to the purview of the court to determine whose value in terms of watching the witnesses testify, who's more credible and who's not credible. Counsel, I assume on the amortization schedule, I assume you're referring to the Tahoe, to the outstanding balance or the balance of the Tahoe property. Let's talk about that for a minute. Correct. It was your client's expert witness that found that the mortgage balance on the date of marriage was 374,305, correct? Correct. Using an amortization schedule, correct. But husband showed, Mr. O'Brien presented evidence showing a balance of 350,000 on January 1st. That's exhibit 152. We have documentation, evidence from a bank versus an expert who has come up with an amortization schedule. Correct. Which controls? Well, why would the expert's testimony control over what a bank says the amount was on a certain date and time? Well, and one of the questions would have been why wasn't that provided by Mr. O'Brien at the case? But putting that aside. The exhibit wasn't provided? Exhibit 152? Well, Mr. Cantor didn't have it when he did his evaluation. And that's part of the issue too. It's perfectly reasonable for an expert to use his amortization schedule to calculate an amount when he didn't have all the, when he didn't have the evidence in front of him. Was that objection lodged? Your Honor, I can't answer that question. I know that there were discovery issues, but I was not the trial counsel in the court below. So we don't know that we're not dealing with apples and oranges here. I am not. I know that there were discovery issues, that Mr. O'Brien wasn't presenting things that were requested on numerous occasions. And that was part of the problem. Additionally, if we've got numbers that are not exactly correct, it's reasonable that if an expert who is looking at all the numbers, he can use an amortization schedule to come up with the actual numbers. So, sure. I don't have an issue with the expert doing an amortization, but once you're at the trial and an exhibit is presented, a bank document showing the, at least appears to say, balance is 350, at that point, doesn't the amortization work either? 
Well, I believe that at the trial level, Mr. Cantor did look at that, and he said that he wasn't disputing the numbers of the bank, but again, that wasn't before him. So that's not, it's perfectly reasonable for him to use that amortization schedule, and if numbers are a little bit off, that still doesn't mean that the trial court can't accept Mr. Cantor's numbers as well. So he didn't dispute the bank statement, but he disagreed with their numbers? No, he just supported his own amortization calculation in terms of what he had before him. And again, there's case law out there that says that if there's a little difference in numbers, that that does not necessarily equate to error. The trial court can accept Mr. Cantor's numbers because he used the amortization schedule. I'd also like to go into the argument regarding the different, the way the trial court treated the HELOCs on a different basis. There was what the court found to be compelling testimony regarding the uses of funds out of wife's HELOC, that they were specifically used, and the numbers matched up correctly to pay off a membership to the golf club, as well as other day-to-day expenses. There was nothing of the sort from Mr. O'Brien. There was some sort of handwritten check that didn't correlate to anything. The trial court made a determination that that evidence and whatever Mr. O'Brien testified regarding those little handwritten checks that didn't correlate to anything were not credible. And that there wasn't, I believe Mr. O'Brien's counsel left out that the footnote in the trial court's determination of why he determined that husband's HELOC was used for only his particular property wasn't necessarily to enhance it, he also said to maintain it. So there didn't need to be any testimony that the property was enhanced, just that the HELOC was on the property and that it was paid by community funds. So there's no dispute that there was specific testimony from wife regarding all the payments made out of funds out of her HELOC, and that it also specifically correlated to direct numbers from the membership from PVCC. Not only the initial payment, but also the subsequent payment of the membership. So in this case, your honors, that is something that the trial court can determine. Mr. O'Brien says that the Dre House case says that you can't do that, that you have to treat these HELOCs the same way. That's not the case. In Dre House, they didn't address a HELOC that was used for community expenses, day-to-day expenses, membership to golf club expenses. That's more like a loan that you take out that should be divided between the parties because it was used for things for the parties, not necessarily used to either pay down a mortgage or maintain a property that is paid for by community funds. So it's perfectly reasonable for the trial court to treat those two HELOCs completely differently. And your honors, unless you have something else, that's all I have. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Before we start the clock, do you have something you want to, some information you want to give us? I'm sorry. Before we start the clock, you've only got a minute and 27 seconds left. You were going to look for something for us? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Please. I have that information. I think that's very interesting. In my opening brief on page 17. Counsel, go ahead and come up to the. Paragraph number six, you will see that I use the words trial exhibit 94 at the start of pages compared to trial exhibit 94 at another set of pages. And those are the two appraisals that we talked about that were in question. Please start the clock. Thank you. Okay. I'll be quick. I counted the number of times that counsel said the HELOC was never paid off during her remarks to the court this morning six times. Why is that relevant? Because if the HELOC was never paid off, 
there was no pay down on the HELOC during the marriage. And if that's the case, then you don't include it in the question as to whether there was principal pay down during the marriage. That's why you don't include HELOCs when you talk about dealing with a Drejos claim. They're too complicated. There are uses for HELOCs that some may be community, some may be separate property. That is why we argued so vehemently that you cannot use a HELOC when you are determining a principal pay down. They didn't use it when we figured the husband's lien on wife's separate property. Her HELOC was taken out of that discussion. We figured her husband's Drejos claim on the principal pay down of the first mortgage during marriage, and we dealt with her HELOC separately as a separate debt. When it came to husband's properties, that is when they used the HELOC to determine the principal pay down, and it was an error that was corrected twice. The first time was when the husband filed his Drejos claim and the wife filed her Drejos claim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your argument. The case will be submitted. Would the clerk call the next case, please?